by George Foster. It was a brighter day for New York as the Mets hopes stayed alive in the National League East. Game three saw the Mets look even better as, as he has so often, Gary Carter provided the heroics for New York and they went on to St. Louis for an even bigger series, but of course the Cardinals won it all in 85. Well, this is 1986 and tonight, the doctor opens the brand new season here at Pittsburgh's Three River Stadium against the resurgent Pirates right here on WOR. age for that clean crisp taste this buds for you by manufacturers Hanover trust we realize your potential by Nissan who invites you to test drive the all-new 1987 Nissan Sentra at your Nissan dealer now by pure later courier the name to remember in overnight Express by Burger King their new chicken tenders are real chicken fillets not processed nuggets by ivory there's a pure natural kind of clean when you lather up with ivory by Metropolitan Life and affiliated companies, a leader in insurance and financial services. And by your New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, Tri-State Chevrolet dealers. Live from Three River Stadium in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania tonight, the New York Mets open the 86 season by taking on the Pittsburgh Pirates. And pitching for the Mets tonight, Dwight Gooden, who is 24 and 4 in 85 with a league leading 1.53 ERA. On the mound for the Pirates, it's Rick Russell, a 14 and 8 comeback season with an ERA of 2.27. Well, hi everybody. I'm Ralph Kiner, along with Tim McCarver and Steve Sabrisky, and a new era here in Pittsburgh. New ownership, and they're hoping to bring Pittsburgh back like they were in the 60s and 70s. So Pittsburgh against the New York Mets. The Mets are playing their 25th opener. They have a record of 14 and 10 in home openers. They lost their first eight, then won nine in a row. And the Pittsburgh Pirates are playing in their 100th opening game. They opened on the road for 60 years and then started playing some openers here at home. So it's baseball once again in the 1986 season. The Mets in their 25th year, they have been the world's champions once. They also have played in the World Series one other time, losing in the seventh game to Oakland. When they were the world's champions, they defeated Baltimore in 1969. Right now, though, let's go down to Tim McCarver and his special guest. All right, thanks a lot, Ralph. It is my pleasure to have with us uh, here on WOR Commissioner Peter Uberoff. Uh, you have sat across from Soviet negotiators. You have done an impossible job at the Olympics back in 1984. Uh, would it be saying too much or, or uh, taking it a bit too far to say that you have an equally tough job this year uh, bringing Pittsburgh franchises like the San Francisco Giants back into respectability? Well, Pittsburgh was really troubled last year. I thought the lawyers would be fighting over where they were playing in this uh, but there's a rebirth. You know, we set criteria that said we want local ownership with roots. And with the local ownership this group has, they're gonna be they're gonna be a franchise to contend with in the future. They may not they may not be the, a great team this year, but I'll tell you they're gonna be competitive. But the crowds, you watch, the crowds will double compared to past years in Pittsburgh, it's gonna be a very good franchise. San Francisco still has some problems. Uh, but I think we can get that done too. Baseball. You know, the five opening days yesterday, all were sellouts, a couple of all-time records, all-time in the history of baseball records. Uh, Yankees, I guess, set the all-time record for their opening day, uh, so it's going to be great. And I can't wait to get back and uh, watch the Mets open. Uh, Mr. Commissioner, you have made statements that baseball will obviously be drug-free, virtually drug-free this year. Uh, your statement on that? You know, the players have dignity. 
and they're and they are going to get rid of it. It's not a commissioner. It's not a union. The players have said enough is enough. And they're, you know, they're most of them, a great majority, never had a problem. And even those few that have had a problem are saying they're, that's behind them. And let's uh, let's make best, let's return the dignity to baseball, the dignity that you brought baseball and other great players have brought baseball. So uh, the, it's over with. And you know, talk's cheap. The fans will see. There's not going to be drug problems anymore. Commissioner of Baseball Peter Uberoff, and for the opening day, the opening game of the baseball season in 1986. We'll be right back right after this word from Budweiser. Well, it all started for Pittsburgh back in 1894, their first home opener. This will be their 100th. They opened on the road for 60 years, and their record 54 and 45. This is their 18th home opener. They have, this will be the 19th. They have had 18 previous home openers, and they have won 11 and lost seven. For the New York Mets, it is their 25th year. They started in 1962. They lost their first nine ball games in 1962, but they didn't have a Dwight Gooden in those days. First game ever won by the Mets, won by Jay Hook after the Mets were nine and a half games out of first place in 62. And here's the sky driver coming in for the first ball at Three River Stadium, and we'll let you know how that comes out maybe sometime later on. That is the Pittsburgh Parrot, who is the mascot here in Pittsburgh. Paris, I thought, could fly. <laughs> they don't need parachutes, right? <laughs> That's right. Well, Pittsburgh, quite a city over the years. A world's championship over the Yankees in 1960. Celebrated unbelievably here in this city. Of course, they had been in World Series before. And, of course, they have seen very dry days at times here of late. Last year, they lost 104 ball games, drew only 735,900 people, and Pittsburgh hoping to make a comeback with new ownership. They expect a capacity crowd here tonight, and while we look at the crowd in the field, we'd like to remind you this copyrighted telecast is presented by authority of the New York Mets and WRTV, and is intended solely for the private non-commercial use of our audience. Any publication, reproduction, retransmission, or other use of the pictures, descriptions, and accounts of this game without the express written consent of the New York Mets and WRTV is prohibited. And now the Pittsburgh Pirates take the field. Bring it home, Mets. Off to you, New York. And the Mets go into the start of the season as the favorite to be the Eastern Division champions. The umpires for this game, Bob Engel behind home plate, Jim Quick, the umpire at first base, Paul Rungi, the umpire at second base, and Dave Pallone, the umpire at third. And defensively for Pittsburgh, Sid Bream is at first base. Johnny Ray playing second base. Sam Khalifa is at shortstop. And Jim Morrison playing third. In the outfield, Steve Kemp in left. Joe Orsolak in center field. R.J. Reynolds in right field. And behind the plate, almost hidden by the umpires, Tony Pena. The pitcher, Rick Russell, who had a brilliant career with the Cubs, lost the whole season because of arm trouble, came back last year to be the comeback player of the year with a record of 14 and 8, an earn run average of 2.27. Rick Russell. And the lineup for the Mets. Lynn Dykstra in there spelling the regular center fielder of last year, Mookie Wilson, who's on the disabled list. Wally Backman batting second. What a spring Wally had. First baseman Keith Hernandez hitting third. Gary Carter behind the plate and batting fourth. Darryl Strawberry with six home runs against the Pirates last year hitting fifth. Left fielder George Foster batting sixth. Howard Johnson, the third baseman, will hit seventh. The dependable Rafael Santana at short, batting eighth, and Dwight Gooden on the mound. I'll tell you one thing, Ralph, there are 18 hitters in the lineup tonight. Nine for the Pirates and nine for the Mets. Dwight Gooden and Rick Russell, both outstanding offensive players. Dwight Gooden setting a record for base hits by a Mets pitcher. He had 21 last year, and of course, Russell has been a good hitter and an excellent fielder. Did not make an error all last season. Was the gold glove pitcher for fielding and now we look at Len Dykstra to lead off. Dykstra with three tenures with the Mets last year ended up hitting 254 with one home run 19 RBIs the first pitch for the Mets and it's a breaking ball for ball one. Kind of interesting to see Russell 
throwing the first pitch of the 1986 season. That is not his best pitch. His best pitch is that, the sinker. Sinking fastball. He has an outstanding sinking fastball. He and his brother Paul combined to pitch the only shutout by brothers in Major League history. They beat the Dodgers 1-0. There again, the sinker. My point was Jack Morris of the Tigers probably wishes he would have thrown something other than his best pitch to Dwight Evans of the Red Sox yesterday. That picture in the <laughs> paper showing him looking over his shoulder after his very first pitch of the year. Was it a that home wonderful? Run. Now the cat a three and run. Dykstra in 83 games for the Mets last year. Had a fine spring hit well enough to get on base a lot and had eight stolen bases. So Dykstra does his thing as he gets on base. And the Mets have a base runner with no one out. And you can look for Davey Johnson to put him in motion. Backman handles the bat very well, and Russell is an ideal pitcher against whom to hit and run. Always around the play in the sick of all pitcher. He hit the ball on the ground, an ideal man for the hit and run. Backman hitting 273 off of last season. One home run, 38 runs batted in. Fine hitter from the left-hand side, and he pops it up into shallow left field. Steve Kemp is there, and he puts it away. So Backman unable to put it on the ground, and Dykstra stays at first. Not a good at bat for Wally Backman hitting the first pitch in the air. No chance for any action there, and it brings up Keith Hernandez. Hernandez with a 264 spring. Following last year's season of 309 with 10 home runs and 91 RBI. Keith set a record for game winning RBIs last year when he had 24. And back in 1979, he was the most valuable player in the National League. He, along with Willie Stargell, the only time they've ever had co winners of the MPP. Keith that year led the league in hitting, batting 344. First pitch is strike to Hernandez. Dykstra, a fairly good sized lead at first, and he draws a throw. Rick Russell with an excellent move to first base. He is a very big man, but as you mentioned, a gold glove winner last year, moves around very well and does a lot of things to help himself. And a fake and a run, and it's hit in the left center field. Tough play. It will be extra bases. Dykstra hesitating at first and second, now being waved in. Khalifa throws the plate, is not in time, and Dykstra scores. Hernandez goes to third, and the Mets lead one to nothing. Outstanding base running by Keith Hernandez going to third on the throw. And a good play by Buddy Harrelson, the third base coach. Right out of the chute, bud. Makes a nice play by sending Dykstra. The Pirates execute well on the front end, but not on the back end. The low throw to Pena. Ball bounces out away from him, and that allows Hernandez to go to third base. Now watch the second hop. Little short hop. Hernandez takes advantage of it. Dykstra scores. Mets out on top. And the batter is Gary Carter. Carter hit 281 last year with 32 home runs. 100 runs batted in. At 298 this spring with a total of seven. Make that four home runs. This ball hit in the air to left field. It should score a run. Hernandez tagged up. The throw by Steve Kemp. And it is not in time. And the Mets lead two to nothing as Carter gets his first run batted in of the year. See, that's the advantage of Hernandez going to third base with one out because you're able to score on something other than a fly ball. It'll take that, or something other than a base hit. It takes that base hit to score you with two out. Kemp does not have a strong arm, and for that reason, Morrison cuts it off and almost gets Hernandez at home. Keith does not run well. Watch Jim Morrison, the third baseman, cut it off. Good play, but a little late. So now it's Daryl Strawberry at the plate. The Mets leading 2 0, and Daryl takes a call strike. Strawberry last year hitting 277 with 29 home runs, 79 runs batted in in 111 games. And this one grounded foul. Two strike count on Daryl Strawberry. Strawberry this spring at 276 with three home runs and 11 RBI. Rick Russell back to the plate. And it is just 
out of the strike zone. It was close. Bob Engel, check Bob Engel on this pitch. He comes up like he's going to call it a strike, and then has second thoughts. Was outside. And now the count goes to two and two. Strawberry had the best home run percentage last year in the National League, a home run of seven for every hundred at bats. And another close one as they work him outside. Now, Russell's got to stay outside with the sinker. All sinker ballers usually will stay outside with that pitch, come in for a ball like and that. another close one. So Strawberry walks. And the Mets keep it going. They're leading, they are leading by a score of two to nothing. A runner on with two men out and George Foster the batter. Second walk in the inning. Batting six and playing in left field. Foster. Foster hit 263 last year with 21 home runs, 77 RBIs, and 146 games. This spring he hit 259 with no home runs and only three RBIs. Former MVP in the National League. And Russell's breaking ball for a ball. Russell with 153 victories in his major league career. And Foster misses the fastball, tied him up with that pitch on the inside part of the plate, and the count at one and one. Rick Russell tries to work right handers inside with the sinker, and he goes away bad with the breaking ball. Look for Strawberry to run. And a strike call. This is a good running situation because if you're pitching to Foster, usually you throw him a breaking ball bad in this count. And if he lays off of it, Strawberry will have a free stolen base. We'll see. One and two the count, two men away. Strawberry with an average lead. He does not go, and it is the breaking ball outside. The count two and two. Pena, one of the best throwing catchers in baseball. Had the league in assists last year with 100. He had 1,034 total chances, second to Gary Carter. And the fastball in tight fouls it back. I got one for you. The last time a pirate catcher had 100 assists in a season, back in 1922 when Johnny Gooch did it. Remember John Moore? Well. ring a bell? <laughs> <laughs> Johnny was a coach when I broke in with the Pirates in 1941. 2-2 pitch. In tight, did he swing? Yes, he did, and that's all for Foster. That's all for the Mets, but they get two on one hit, and they leave one. The score at the end of one half inning, the Mets two, the Pirates coming up. Now here's a word from Manufacturers Handover Trust. Mets take the field. They have Keith Hernandez at first base, Wally Backman playing second base, the shortstop Rafael Santana, Howard Johnson at third, George Foster in left field, Len Dykstra, the center fielder, and Daryl Strawberry in right. The catcher, Gary Carter. And on the mound, it is the phenomenal Dwight Gooden, who last year won 24 and lost only four. He led the league in that department. He led the league in ERA at 1.53. So it'll be R.J. Reynolds playing in center field. Last minute switch defensively by Lee Leyland, the manager. And the fastball for a strike. Then we'll try to give you the lineup quickly. Joe Ursulak hitting second, followed by Johnny Ray. Sid Green batting fourth. Steve Kemp fifth. Tony Pena, Jim Morrison, and Sam Khalifa batting eighth. And, of course, Rick Russell, the pitcher. As we said, a good hitting pitcher. Two strikes to count. Reynolds last year hit 282 overall with three home runs, 42 RBIs. He came from the Dodgers during the season. This ball hit the deep right field. It's way back. It's going. It is gone. Goodbye. R.J. Reynolds. Pittsburgh and their ball team 
That's something to be excited about. An 0-2 mistake by Gooden. Not with pitch selection, but in location. That ball right down Broadway. And Dwight Gooden is yet to throw a ball. And the crowd here certainly responding to the home run by R.J. Reynolds. The next batter is Joe Orsolak. And Joe hitting 300 last year to lead the National League rookies. Orsolak, no home runs, 21 RBIs, had a home run this spring against the Mets. His only home run in spring training. And the count now at one ball and one strike. That is the first home run hit off Dwight Gooden in 75 innings. And that, of course, goes back to last year. And the pitch is out of the glove, out of the strike zone. The count, two balls and one strike. The last man to hit a home run off Gooden was Rick Shue of the Phillies back in the fourth inning at Shea Stadium on August 15th. That is only the third earned run given up by Gooden, dating back to last year in a long, long time. And now the count at three and one. Gooden finished the season allowing only two earned runs in his last 56 innings pitched. But he did not have a good spring. He did, however, had a, have a last, a good outing against Minnesota where he pitched seven innings and he gave up four hits and no runs. That was his last time that he pitched. And it's bounced back to Gooden and flagged down by Dwight to throw for the out. Johnny Ray, the toughest man in the National League to strike out last year. Had only 24 strikeouts and 652 official at bats. That's one strikeout every 27 at bats. Ray batted 274 last year with seven home runs, and he grounds this one in the hole, and it's through for a base hit. So the Pirates, after dropping behind 2-0, respond with a run in on the home run, and now another man on. The time run on. This ball down and in. Backman playing a little towards second. You have to do that with good and pitching because you don't expect left-handers to pull him that much. And on the rug, it creeps through there. That'll bring up Sid Bream, the first baseman. Jason Thompson traded away by, by Pittsburgh to make room for Sid, who was acquired from the Dodgers. Green last year hit 230. Six home runs, 21 RBIs. Batted 284 for the Pirates last year with three home runs. And he hits it in the air to left. Playable for Foster. Johnny Ray way down to second, now easing back to first base. So two men away. Mets leading two to one. And the batter will be Steve Kemp. Kemp had a 250 for the Pirates last year in 92 ball games. His greatest year was at Detroit in 1976. Make that 79 when he batted 318 with 26 home runs, 105 RBI. Steve, yeah. had, Steve had a terrible year last year. He was on the DL three times. And for that reason, he carried number 13 around with him last year, and he's changed to 23, hoping for better results. He has tristodectophobia then. Yep, the fear of the number 13. One strike to count. It's easy for you to say. <laughs> <laughs> Just found out that Frank Cash, the general manager of the New York Mets, was born on Friday the 13th, yeah. as Steve Sabrisky was. And there's a good fastball right there. That was the Hummer. That's a good riding fastball right around the letters. So it's 0-2 to Steve Kemp. Gooden led the major leagues in strikeouts last year with 268. He has not had one yet. Tossed to first base. Gooden, who did not have a good move to first his rookie year, Improved his mood so much last year that he is now considered very tough on the mound at picking runners off. Good running situation right here. 0 and 2 with two outs. And the pitch strike three called, and Gooden gets his first strikeout of the year. In the inning, one run on two hits. The home run by R.J. Reynolds. One man left. The score at the end of one. The Mets two. The Pirates one. Now here's a word from Nissan. 
Howard Johnson, the leadoff for the Mets. Top of the second, the Mets leading two to one. Johnson, a 242 hitter last season with 11 home runs and 46 RBIs. And Rick Russell misses on the outside. Johnson, the 78th man to play third base for the New York Mets in their 24 year history. And this one popped up behind home. Playable for Tony Pena, and Johnson fouls out. So one away. Well, there he is again. The parrot has landed. It took him a long time to get down. Now, check his headgear when he hits the turf. I will show you that later. <laughs> You're jumping the gun there. All right, that'll bring up Rafael Santana. Santana, 257 batter in 85. One home run, 29 RBIs. And he hits with some, this one deep to left field. If it's fair, it's gone, but it is a foul ball. Santana hit his one home run off of Guente, a pirate relief pitcher last year. Cecilio Guante. Here we go. Now the parrot has landed. Now check his headgear. Whoa. Lost his head. <laughs> Russell back with the fastball inside. The count one ball, one strike. And the slider punched to the right side just by Bill Robinson, the first base coach. And Russell with a count of one and two. See Steve or Joe Arcelak in right field playing very shallow, and that's what you have to do with Santana. Does not drive the ball to right field, especially with two strikes. And the slider again, the count two balls and two strikes. Santana played 154 games last season for the Mets, a fine defensive shortstop. And the sinker, strike three. So Russell gets his second strike out of the game. Well, this is a nasty pitch right here. See the little tail on the end? What it does, it may have been a little outside, but when a catcher's sitting like that, you deserve those pitches, and Rick certainly deserved that one. That was a nasty fastball. And it brings up Dwight Gooden. Gooden with 21 hits last year to lead the Met pitchers, and he gets a breaking ball for strike one. Gooden with a home run, his first major league home run against the Pirates last year. It was, it was off of a Rick, but it was Rick Roden. That puts a count at strike two. Been a three-run homer against Rick Roden, who will not be starting in, the, in this Mets series. Ron Darling goes against Larry McWilliams Thursday night after an off day tomorrow. And the breaking ball, a good slider, strike three. So the Mets go in order. The score at the end of one and a half. The Mets two, the Pirates one. Now here's a word from Budweiser. Played in four decades of baseball in the major leagues, Tim McCarver. And the batter Tony Pena leading off, batting 249, or he batted 249 last year with 10 home runs. Tony Pena, always a great matchup when you see Pena against Gooden. Because of that. <laughs> Boy, he is a free swinger all the way. <laughs> Watch this action here. Fastball against a hard swinging catcher. And that bat flying all over the place. He racks it up against his back. And one series, he broke 10 bats in a three game series. 0 oh 1 to Tony Pena. Mets up 2 to 1, bottom of 2. Fastball inside, 1 and 1. A veritable litany of records that this young man will break before he is through pitching obviously if he stays healthy good fastball one and two came the youngest pitcher to start and win a ball game last year started at the age and won at the age of 20 years four months and 24 days ground ball toward third Howard Johnson on the high hop easy play one out the New York Rangers face off against the Philadelphia Flyers in exciting playoff action tomorrow night at 7.30. And immediately following, don't miss the special of news, 9 at 10.30. Here's a swing of Pena. And that bat going around his head. Boy, does he take a cut. Takes such a healthy cup, a cut. He pulled a ribcage muscle this spring. Was out for a week. 
Jim Morrison takes a curveball for a strike. Jim makes his home in the spring training headquarters of the Pirates down in Bradenton, Florida. Came to the Pirates back in 82 for pitcher Eddie Solomon from the Chicago White Sox. Tell you one thing, Dwight Gooden is throwing strikes tonight. Right here, the fastball, and he has something on it. He's over 90 with that one. Perfect spot. Fastball down the middle. Santana, two out. Raphael with that time throw to first. He's one of the few that will time it over there, not putting anything extra on it, knowing you can get his man with a soft toss. A lot of finesse. And the strong arm shortstop of the Pirates, Sammy Khalifa, the batter. Sammy batting 238 for the Pirates last year. He did have four home runs, so he's got some pop. Grounded up the middle. Again, Santana. And an easy inning for Doc Gooden. Pirates go in order. Five in a row retired by Gooden. And after two, it's the Mets two and the Pirates one. We'll go to the third after this word from Pirolita Courier. Lynn Dykstra lifts the first pitch to left fielder Steve Kemp. Leading off the third inning, so one pitch, one out. Rick Russell, Russell loves to work fast. Very, very quick worker. So with one out, the better Wally Backman. Mets lead it two to one with one out here in the third inning. Backman flied to left his first time up. The Mets with two runs in the top of the first, an RBI double by Hernandez and a sacrifice fly by Gary Carter. And then in the bottom of the first on an 0-2 pitch, R.J. Reynolds hit a home run off Dwight Gooden. 0-1. At home run by Reynolds, the first ever hit off Dwight Gooden. The only other extra base hit by a pirate as Gooden could file the 4-0 record against Pittsburgh, a double by Lee Lacy. This one just misses inside, 1-1. One one. Backman led the Mets with a 377 average this spring. He had a marvelous spring. Nitty gritty and competitive. 2-1. Took something off that sinker. Two and two. Talk about a great story. Dwight Gooden in 85. Well, Rick Russell was a pretty big story himself. Fourth in the National League and earned run average with a 2.26. Curveball fouled off. Counterpart Tim Tuffle had a fine spring. They're mm -hmm. going to split second base. Tuffle hit 353. Tim Tough. Tuffle, the probable starter at second base on Thursday night against the left hander Larry McWilliams, opposing Ron Garland. Another one tapped foul, so it's still two and two. That's going with a 24 man roster, as are all the other clubs in the National League. That's one less than the amount allowed. And the Mets will two platoon at second and two platoon at third. Gray Knight with the left-handed or the switch hitting Howard Johnson. And Backman fouls another one back. So he's hanging tough. Keith Hernandez with an RBI double his first time up is on deck. Outfield shifted toward left. And it's inside, so the count's full to Wally Backman. Backman pulling the ball more this spring, working on it, too, and doing a good job. Ball is outside. Now, you talk about a good at bat. The count was one and two to Backman. He fouled a couple off. Ball two. Fouled a couple more off. Ball three. And then he got the walk. This is what happened in Hernandez first at bat. Keith Hernandez with Len Dykstra on at first base, drills it up the alley in left center field. Dykstra, a fine bit of base running, comes in to score. And Hernandez, a better 
effort by going on to third and Hernandez came in the score on a sack fly by Carter to give the Mets a two nothing lead. Pirates got one back and a home run by R.J. Reynolds. Good hit and run situation here. Remember on a hit and run situation you do not have to have a good jump at first. So it's imperative you not get picked off if the hit and run is indeed in effect. Not running and Hernandez takes high. Hernandez checking Buddy Harrelson at third. Whenever a third base coach looks away like that nonchalantly that used to be a catcher's sign to pitch out. Trying to decoy. Yeah, right. Nothing's on. Don't worry about a thing. We're right. not going to do anything. You got it. So look for Backman to run. Two to one Mets. One out. Backman at first. Top of the third. Not running. And a curveball misses. Two and zero. Oh. A lot of times a hit and run sign or even a steal sign will be when the third base coach walks away from you, not even looking at you. Yep. We've talked about this many times over the years. This, in our opinion, is not a good hit and run situation because the count is 2 and 0, oh, and for the most part, a hitter has a free swing. We'll see what Davey Johnson does. Backman not running, and the ball a high strike, and Hernandez took it for a strike, 2 and 1. A good hitter like Keith Hernandez, when he has a count in his favor, will set for a pitch, look for it in a certain zone. If he doesn't get it there, he'll take it, whether it's a strike or ball. Hernandez steps out. He had something in his eye. It's a bit windy here in Pittsburgh. I'd say between 50 and 55 degrees. Enough for Ralph Kiner to be donning a sweater vest. <laughs> Strike on the inside corner. So it's two and two to Keith Hernandez. We're going to go to the wall because it's going <laughs> to get down to about 35 degrees tonight. Here's a pitch right here. It goes around the inside part of the plate. Two and two. One out. Ball is high. You can bet your house Backman <laughs> will be going on this pitch. And your condo down in Florida. That's right. These things are not easy to get rid of nowadays. <laughs> I understand there's a joke going around. <laughs> there goes the runner. The ball is low, and Rick Rushell has walked in two and a third innings, his fourth batter. And, la and last year he averaged two walks per nine innings. Very uncharacteristic of Russell. He has struck out three. He's walked four and given up only one hit. The Mets have the lead two to one. Gary Carter with a sacrifice fly and an RBI his first time up. He drove in a hundred last year. And a happy birthday to Mr. Carter. 32 years old today. Strike one. On opening day games, Carter has hit 341 with six home runs. And six times he has opened the season on his birthday. Overall, he's played 11 opening day games. Fouls this one off, so it's 0-2 to Gary. He won the opening day game against the Cardinals last year at Shea Stadium with a 10th inning home run. Incidentally, in that game, Gooden gave up a home run to Jack Clark. In his first at bat, leading off the second inning, Darrell Strawberry on deck. Oh, good pitch. Carter goes down on strikes, fourth strikeout for Rick Russell, and the batter will be Darrell Strawberry. Goes to the fastball here to get Carter. And Carter coming back to the bench as. Russell has really been pitching well. Daryl Strawberry walked his first time up. One and oh. Strawberry with 29 home runs last year, 22 in the second half of the season. Swings from his heels, one and one. 
They're all out of action from May 11th to June 28th. Missed 43 ball games last year and still came up with fine numbers 29 home runs, 79 RBI. Tore the ligament in his right thumb. It's still bandaged and still giving him trouble. That's a high strike, and Strawberry didn't agree with home plate umpire Bob Engel. Well, let's check it out again. I'd have to say it's a strike. Yep. You got 6'6 six, six at the bat, right? 6'6, six, six, 195 pounds. Daryl Strawberry. Swings and fouls it, and Pena drops it. And an interesting point. You see where Wally Backman is. Wally is retreating to second base now. But that's a, a very interesting point because it was two strikes and two outs. And he went all the way to third base, taking nothing for granted. Very key play when you're on second and there are two strikes and two outs. Whenever the hitter starts that swing, you take off. Two and two. You're at the ballpark at Shea next week, and you see Buddy Harrelson going 2-2 two, two with two strikes and two outs. You know what he's telling that runner at second. Foster on deck. So the runners will be off. Three and two to Daryl Strawberry. Backman at second, Hernandez at first. Two to one Met lead here in the third. There go the runners, and Strawberry draws his second consecutive walk. All three runners on base are due to the wildness and uncharacteristic wildness, as you said, Ralph, of Rick Russell. Russell pitching extremely carefully to Daryl Strawberry, and the one thing that can cure pitchers from being so careful on Strawberry would be the hitter behind him. They'd rather take their chances with Foster than Strawberry. Foster struck out his first time up. Russell winding with the bases loaded. Her ball is outside. Foster has 12 Grand Slam home runs. Second to Dave Kingman as far as active Grand Slam home runs. He takes a strike, one and one. That was his pitch right there. Bases loaded. Backman at third, Hernandez at second, and Strawberry at first. George had a grand slam home run against Ray Fontenot of the Cubs last year. And he fouls this one back. You see that 1-0 pitch right down the middle you take, and now on a 1-1 count, you give the pitcher a chance to make his pitch, and that was Russell's pitch. That was a very tough pitch to hit high and inside, all working in on your hands. One and two to Foster. Two out, bases loaded. Breaking ball backs up on the inside part, and that could very easily have been a big, big mistake. Two and two. If it had been out over the plate a little more, it would have been an ideal pitch to hit. Check swing, fouled down the first baseline. Sid Breen feels it. But it's still two and two to George Foster, and he may have broken his back. We'll see. Yep, you can see it right in the handle. Strange place for a bat to break. Usually on check swings down on the end. You mentioned <laughs> Tony Pena breaking those 14 bats in that seven-day road trip, and this is how Tony does it. <laughs> right here, it's right off the end of the bat. <laughs> Fortunately for Foster, it's off the end of the bat. No swing of any consequence, and that ball going foul keeps him alive. So the base is still loaded. Two to one, New York leads. Rounded towards second, Johnny Ray takes it himself. So Foster is now stranded five and two at bat. As the Mets go down, they strand three here in the third, but they lead two to one after two and a half. Now, here's a word from Newsday. 
Well, the bad news is that the Mets home opener on April 14th is sold out. The good news is that the Mets are having another celebration on opening day number two for you to see baseball like it ought to be. On Wednesday, April 16th, the Mets take on the National League champion Cardinals at 1.35 p.m. The festive atmosphere of Shea Stadium that day will include all the hoopla of opening day, including marching bands, bunting, color guards, and yes, even Rodney J Dangerfield will make his long-awaited return to Shea Stadium. Rodney is the perfect host for opening day, too, because neither one gets any respect. But with opening day sold out, what can you lose by sharing an afternoon with Rodney and the Mets? Plenty of seats are available for opening day, too. Call 718-507-TIXX for all ticket information. That's opening day, too, Wednesday, April 16th at 1.35 p.m. And a big treat also, the home weekend of the Mets 1986 season is Snaffer Calendar Weekend, the first weekend. All fans attending the Mets-Phillies game on Saturday, April 19th, and Sunday, April 20th, will receive a handsome Mets calendar courtesy of Snapper, Moores, Tillers, and Tractors. This unique calendar takes you from opening day through the playoffs and World Series right to next year's spring training. So come on out to Shea for Snapper Calendar Weekend, and here's how you can do it. For tickets, call 718-507-TIXX. Easy to remember. Rick Rushell, a good hitting pitcher, will be the first batter to face Dwight Gooden here in the third inning. Two to one ball game. Mets on top. Fast ball for a strike. Good curveball, and Gooden tried to barehand it. Well, I'll tell you, all sorts of red lights go off in Davey Johnson and Mel Stottlemyre's mind when they see Dwight Gooden going after that. Woo. Well, he sticks that hand out. I think at the last second he sort of thinks, well, I better get it back in. But he doesn't, but Santana backs up the play. You know, there's a lot more Met action to come, so open up a cold Budweiser and get ready with a clean, crisp taste that only comes from Beechwood Aging. Hey, this Bud's for you. Dwight Gooden, by reaching for balls like that, I'd have that finger opened up instead of a Budweiser. Here's R.J. Reynolds. He homered his first time up on an 0-2 pitch. Nicknamed Shoes by his Dodger teammates. He left them in the first inning. What a jug that was. 0-2 again to Reynolds. He was in the Madlock trade that saw Bill go to the Dodgers and solidify that ball club. It opened it up for Guerrero to go back to the outfield, and that's when the Dodgers got hot last year. Now Guerrero on the DL and maybe out for three months. Mm. Another curveball got him looking. So Dwight Gooden, not making that mistake again, throws a nasty curveball on this 0 2 count. And Gooden picks up his second strikeout. And when you hit a home run off the fastball, Good and says, I'll show you something else. And he did, a curveball. Here's Joe Orsolak, who led the Pirates in hitting last year with the 300 average. Fine young player. A bunt attempt. And usually with two out and nobody on, it's not a good idea to bunt, but Orsolak, with 24 stolen bases last year, can stretch a single into a double. And no major league home runs. Right. He was second to Mark Salas for Rookie of the Year lead in hitting. Salas hit actually just a couple of percentage points, decimal points more. Salas hitting 300 and Orsolak hitting 2997. Mark Salas, the catcher for the Minnesota Twins, or one of them, and it's one and one to Joe Orsolak. Opening day of 1986. An unusual 6.05 starting time. Grounded inside the bag. Orsolak's going to have at least a double. He's going to go for three. Dykstra alertly backing up that play, and Dykstra made a heck of a play. Otherwise, you might be thinking of four bags instead of three. Well, the ball punched right over third base, and down the line, it hits something on the fence out here and bounces directly at a 90-degree angle. Foster can't catch up with it. Dykstra, coming from center field, cuts it off, and Orslak in with a three-base hit. Just 
just inside the line. Now watch Dykstra. There's that hop off the fence, hitting that post. And Dykstra in pursuit cuts it down. Could have been an inside the park home run. That's only the third extra bit base hit by the Pirates off of Gooden in his career. Here's Johnny Ray. He singled his first time up. 0 and 1. Johnny Ray with a chance to pick up an RBI. Unusually, and shows you, I guess, why the Pirates lost 104 games last year. Ray led the team in RBIs with 70. One and one. Johnny Ray from Choto, Oklahoma. Attended the University of Arkansas. And he lines one foul down the third baseline. Boy, you talk about a good piece of hitting on that particular pitch. This ball, a curveball outside, and Ray, a tough man to strike out, the toughest in the National League, gets a lot of it, but it is just foul. He's a fine hitter left-handed and not quite as good right-handed, but he can hit left-handed. One and two to Johnny Ray. Her ball tap. Gooden should have the play. And Hernandez covering. So Gooden pitch out, pitches out of mild trouble here in the third. No runs a hit. One left after three. It's two to one Mets. Now here's a word from Budweiser. In innings, a song that I'm sure Glenn Miller is sorry he didn't record. I want to bop with you, baby, was played here in Pittsburgh. A very festive evening. And bopping in for the play-by-play, -play, Steve Zabriskie. <laughs> Thank you, Timmy, and hi, everybody. It's Howard Johnson to lead off, and he hits the first pitch high in the air to left field. Steve Kemp puts it away, and very quickly, one away. Got a lot of first ball hitting going on here so far tonight. And the batter will be Raphael Santana. Santana looked at a called third strike his first time up. One of four recorded by Rick Russell so far, who has pitched very well. strike call it is just amazing that Rick Russell can come back and have the durability that he's had not only the success he had nine complete games last year swing and a miss on an inside pitch and it's 0 and 2 it was a guy who missed the entire 1982 season just member of the Yankees at the time just about everybody had written him off mm -hmm. it's low one and two more inclined because of his age true when you're young and you get hurt they say you can bounce back but not so when you're older and strike three called again Santana looks at a call third strike for the second consecutive at bat and Russell has struck out five a Rafi gives up on this pitch you see the front side leave and now he just freezes on that breaking ball upset with himself Two out, nobody on for the doctor, Dwight Gooden, who had predicted that he would hit a home run today. That's right, he did. In fact, he has a bet with one of the New York writers, Marty Noble of Newsday. Right. Uh -huh. Marty will have to shave <laughs> off his beard if the doctor hits one out. Two balls, no strikes. Dwight struck out swinging his first time up. Grounded up the middle, and a base hit into center field. Well, I wonder if uh, Marty will have to at least trim it now. Maybe wear a mustache, huh? Take a fourth of it off. <laughs> kind of hate to root against Gooden, but you kind of hope he doesn't hit a home run. We might have to look at the real Marty Noble for the rest of the year. <laughs> that a nasty sinker, and Gooden fights it off. I'm sure I won't hear about that one. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's only the second base hit for the Mets off Rick Russell, and here's Len Dykstra with Gooden at first and two out. Dykstra's 0 for 1. He walked and scored in the first and flied deep down the left field line in the third. And a 
breaking ball it drops in there for strike one tell you Gooden can run and I know you don't want to send your Cy Young Award winning pitcher but I wouldn't allow anybody to play behind me like that I'll tell you Bob Gibson will take off he stole nine bases in 1967 with the Cardinals that's a little bit high and away and it's one and one yeah first baseman Sid Bream is sort of semi holding good and he's staying there until Russell's ready to pitch and then moving back foul tip into the glove of Pena and the count one and two Dykstra led the Mets in stolen bases this spring successful in eight of eleven attempts last year he stole 15 while with New York he fouls this one right back below us and the count holds at one and two. How about the crowd here tonight, Steve? Isn't it wonderful? This is a, a rare sight in this city. They usually do draw quite well on opening day. Opening days have been a traditionally big day here, but it's really tapered off after that the last few seasons, to say the least. So it'll be interesting to see what it's like on Thursday. Nice play by Payne on a ball in the dirt. It's two and two. Well, Bill Webb and Ralph Kiner and I drove over in the cab today. It was a very warm banner that we saw. A fellow standing with the banner reading, I need tickets. <laughs> I've never seen that here at Three Rivers. No. Or at Forbes Field, that'll, for that matter. That'll take a picture of that one. Mm -hmm. Two and two to Dykstra. Well hit to center field. And Reynolds, who was shaded way over in left center, has a long way to go, but he gets there. And the inning is over. A hit and one left in the fourth for New York. And in the middle of the fourth, the Mets lead the Pirates 2-1. to one. And we're back after this for Burger King. Dwight Gooden working with a 2-1 lead here as we go to the bottom half of the fourth inning. Steve Zabriskie along with Tim McCarver and Ralph Kiner coming to you on opening day 1986 as far as the Mets and Pirates are concerned at least. Sid Bream will lead it off. Steve Kemp and Tony Pena to follow. Bream flying to left his first time up. Ripped down the right field line and a fair ball into the corner. Strawberry waits for it and here's a throw to second. And Bream is in there with a double. I'll tell you what, from the naked eye, I think if Santana had stayed on second base, I think the throw was strong enough to possibly get Sid Bream. We'll see. See how he's going out? You don't go out to get the ball. The ball will get to you quicker than going out and catching it and trying to bring it back. Had he stayed on the bag, it's similar. We used to say that the second baseman and shortstop. Watch Santana go out, get the ball, stay on the bag, and I think you got brain. I agree. You cannot bring that ball as fat, uh, back as fast as it's traveling. Fourth hit for the Pirates. Three of them have been for extra bases. Steve Kemp fouls one back for strike one. Kemp looked at a called third strike to end the first inning. Of course, Santana, in fairness to him, is protecting that left wrist of his where he got a, a, a short hop off of the heel of his hand the other day. So that's certainly understandable, but unless the ball is tailing from a second baseman or shortstop, they ought to stay on the back. Don't go out and meet the ball. Same as a catcher guarding home plate. You go out and get the ball, then you, you vacate the uh, home plate. You don't protect the plate, and usually a runner score as a result. You give up your advantage as Santana <laughs> mad enough to bite the balloon. <laughs> Bream at second with the leadoff double. Nobody out here in the bottom of the four. One strike, the count to Steve Kemp. Hit high in the air to left. Foster doesn't have to move very far. And there's one away as Bream goes back to second. Guys like Sid Bream and Sammy Khalifa, Joe Orsalak, not necessarily name players around the league. And it, this club has reminded me of Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. They kept saying, who are those guys? And this could be that kind of team this year. Yeah. That would sneak up on some people. Or at least be tough to shake. 
Lost 104 games last year, the most of any other major league team, the most in the American League. The Cleveland Indians lost 102. But they're out of the box in a hurry this year, beating the Orioles yesterday, 6-4. to four. Tony Pena grounded to third back in the second inning, batting here with Green still at second, now one out. And a fastball from Gooden misses low, but not by much, 1-0. will flip to Santana for the double play and the inning is over. Pena hit it like a rocket but Hernandez turned it into two outs. Two to one after the, the Mets lead it. Now here's a word from Nissan. Wally Backman will lead off the top of the fifth inning for the Mets. New York leading it two to one. And Backman hits the first pitch on the ground. Nice play by Breen who retires him unassisted, one away. And let's go back and look at that inning-ending double play off the line drive by Johnny Ray, or rather, Tony Pena. Of course, the alertness of Keith Hernandez, never a problem. Didn't have to jump for that ball, but Bream, understandably, off of second base and an easy 3-6 double play. And on cue, Keith. Hernandez has doubled in a run, scored a run himself, and walked. One out, nobody on. Popped up into short center field. Reynolds coming on and calling for it. And R.J. squeezes it. They're two away. The pitch that Russell just threw to Hernandez, a lot of hitters will come back. Of course, Keith's not one of them, but they'll say he took something off of that pitch. Well, that's not always the case. What a pitcher will do, he'll choke a ball occasionally and throw what he's thinking is going to be the fastball and it's just just enough off of it to get a guy like Hernandez to throw him off stride. Gary Carter the hitter and he hits one right back up the middle knocked down by Russell who then throws him out and the inning is over. So Russell continues to impress as he retires the Mets in order here in the fifth inning after four and a half still two to one New York. Now here's a word from R.C. Cola. Thursday night at 7, it's an early edition of News 9 Primetime with the latest in news, weather, and sports, immediately followed by the Mets against the Pirates at 7.30, right here on Channel 9. Well, we're going to the bottom half of the fifth inning with the Mets leading Pittsburgh 2-1. to one. And coming back in to call it for you, here's Tim McCarver. Jim Morrison, the batter, he grounded the short his first time up. It's a 2-1 to one ball game, four hits for Pittsburgh, and two... For the Mets and the Pittsburgh Pirates have hit for the cycle so far tonight. That's right. Their four hits have been a single, double, triple, and home run. Her ball outside. Gooden gave up a leadoff homer to R.J. Reynolds in the bottom of the first after the Mets had taken the lead with an RBI double by Hernandez in the top of the first and a sacrifice fly by Gary Carter. 1-0. Tried to hold up, went too far. One and one to Jim Morrison. Originally a product of the Philadelphia Phillies. He's a good little ball player. He had a good spring, too. He had 349 with 11 RBIs. Actually won the third base job. Played behind, of course, Bill Madlock. Has several years filling in for Mad Dog. Tommy Lasorda has changed Madlock's name, I understand. Yeah, he's now glad dog. <laughs> two and two to Morrison. <laughs> Happy to be in Dodger Stadium. And be in Dodger Blue. There are some guys clad in blue that are very happy. One of them, Tim Tuffle from Greenwich, Connecticut. He is fourth from the right. Sid Fernandez in there. Ball hit fairly well to left, but George Foster's there. One out. Well, here's what's happening elsewhere in the National League. The Expos at Atlanta. The Cubs will be at St. Louis. The Giants at Houston and San Diego at Los Angeles for the second game for those two clubs. 
And Sammy Khalifa, the batter. Slick fielding shortstop of the Pirates. Sammy also grounded to short his first time up, and he lifts this one to right. Strawberry there. Two out. The other trouble that Gooden has been in during this game, a two-out triple by Joe Orsalak in the third, and a leadoff double by Sid Bream, but the excellent double play turned by Hernandez to Santana. So the better will be Rick Russell. Hey, fans, a great way to reward yourself after the game, win or lose, is with the clean, crisp taste of a Beechwood-aged Budweiser. Yes, sir, this Bud's for you. And Russell fouls it back. Rick grounded one up the middle his first time up. Gooden wanted to barehanded it, barehanded, pull his hand back in time, even though it did get a piece of his hand, but he's all right. Santana threw him out. One and one. Curveball is high. Two and one to Rick Russell. Russell for his career is 10 and 19 against the New York Mets, but it should be pointed out that most of those seasons were with Chicago when the Cubs did not have good ball clubs. Ground ball again up the middle. Santana on a nice play. Throws him out. Three up, three down here in the fifth inning. And after five, it's two to one, New York. We go to the sixth after this word from Budweiser. Well, in the American League today, the Yankees open at home with a four to two victory over Kansas City. Elsewhere, Toronto will be at Texas, California at Seattle, and Minnesota at Oakland many opening days and the commissioner whom I had the pleasure of interviewing before the game told me it was the largest home crowd ever as strawberry rips one to left center he's going to have at least a double Daryl strawberry into second he has been on base three straight times we'll get to that Yankee story and the commissioner's words right after this replay well, Daryl going with the pitch not trying to do too much with it and just gets it over the top of Sammy Khalifa's glove. And Darrell cruises into second. What a swing he has, huh? Still, even though he was fully extended and out in front a little bit, able to generate so much power the other way. Never been a question about that. Nor George Foster. As he lifts one to right, this could be trouble. Orsalak a long way, and it's over his head. Foster's liable to have a triple. And there he goes to third. He's going to be out at third. Strawberry scores. Foster thrown out at third on a good recovery by Orsalak. And the Mets lead it three to one. Well, George just pops this ball up. Orsalak, who was shading him towards center field, had a long way to go. And, of course, on the artificial surface, you know that ball is going to take off. Strawberry actually was prepared to tag up and go to third, and George trying to stretch it to a triple is thrown out. Orsalak recovers and hits the cutoff man, which is the key right here, and a great play by Johnny Ray because he short hopped him a little bit, and Ray came up with it to get it to Morrison in time. This is one of those oh no jobs. All you can do is turn and go get it, and Hort Orsalak hustled enough, and Ray made a great relay to throw a Foster out, or Khalifa, I should say, making the relay. And it's one and one to Howard Johnson. So Foster has a bloop double for an RBI. And Strawberry scoring, the Mets lead it three to one. It's two and one on Howard Johnson. Top of the sixth inning, one out. Three and one. What I was going to say about what the commissioner said, he said it was the largest opening day crowd in New York Yankee history. And that is a long and storied history. Indeed it is. Ripped inside the first baseline and fielded by the right field ball girl. <laughs> so I guess this is a community effort here in Pittsburgh, right? <laughs> well, you know, these, these girls are called the Pirettes, 
and they have been absent here at Three Rivers Stadium for a while. It's a thing they used to have with ball girls. They did away with it for a couple of years. And this is her first game, and apparently <laughs> she wasn't sure. Yeah, but you don't pirate everything, <laughs> right? I mean, the reason that Pittsburgh, the re and Davey Johnson is out to talk. Now, in the umpire's judgment, if they think Johnson could have gotten a triple on the play, I think they could have given it to him. Certainly, if a, if a runner was at first base and they thought the runner may have scored, they could give him home. Davey arguing that. That's a good argument, but he says, all right. Speaking of Paul Rungi. Worth was, taking a shot. I was going to say, here in Pittsburgh, the reason that the Pirates are called Pirates was because they pirated players. <laughs> <laughs> back in in the 1890s now that young lady obviously embarrassed but Howard Johnson is it but they however never... George Foster may be <laughs> well good point making the first out at third base is not good strategy and even though Orsalak to George's credit or not to his credit but in fairness to George Orsalak did make a very, very good recovery down there. Bob walked the right-hander, Pat Clements the left-hander. But nonetheless, it was a bad base running play by George. Had he been on second, of course, he would have scored on Johnson's hit. I thought the most unusual part about it was when the ball girl came up with the ball, it looked as if she was ready to make a throw. Yeah, she was ready to hit the cutoff <laughs> she, man once she holding to a single. <laughs> <laughs> try to cut Hojo down. <laughs> Santana has caved twice. And a fastball misses outside. So it's 1-0 to Rafael Santana. Three straight extra base hits here in the sixth inning. Have played it only one run. Figure that one out. <laughs> Obviously because Foster was thrown out. Three straight doubles. fastball high so it's three and oh Russell has already walked five while giving up only 52 bases on balls in 194 innings last year and on cue Bill Webb flashes to Dwight Gooden who gave up only 68 walks last year well he's swinging three and oh and he taps it to short and Khalifa throws out his counterpart for the second out Dwight Gooden, the batter. Dwight single his last time up. And he's also struck out. Goodness. I beg your pardon, Rushell has five strikeouts and he's also walked five, as we said. Swings and misses. Dwight hit 226 last year with a home run, nine RBIs, a club record 21 base hits, but he is not nearly satisfied with that. Grounds this one off the end of the bat, Sam Khalifa, and he throws good now. One run on three straight doubles here in the sixth inning. The Mets have a 3-1 lead going into the bottom of the sixth, and we'll carry that for you after this word from the 9X business system. Peter Uberoth on hand for the game tonight. He threw out the first ball here in Pittsburgh. And the mayor of the fine city of Pittsburgh, Richard Caligiuri, to Peter's left. And the batter will be R.J. Reynolds. R.J. one for two. Home run his first time up tonight. And a curveball is high. 1-0 to R.J. Reynolds. 3-1 Met lead, bottom of the sixth inning. Gooden has given up four hits. And that ball is close, and it's 2-0 to Reynolds. Woo. Reynolds almost moves the wrong way on this pitch. Just does get out of the way. Well, that is a big league breezer right there. I think you call it right, Steve. I think he moved into the ball. That ball was really, as it showed on the replay, not that far inside. Bob Gibson used to say to hitters, just think out there. Don't be going out there. 2-0. Oh. 
swung from his shoes again. <laughs> well, they nicknamed him, as you look at the pirate parrot, who has some funny-looking shoes. They nicknamed him shoes in L.A. because he has a vast collection of footwear. Nicknamed by his Dodger teammates. And that's only one pair. <laughs> <laughs> and not the pair, not no. the type of shoes that, that uh, his teammates are talking about. <laughs> Yeah, those are those are good too. Those are bad shoes right there. Man. Those are bad feet. That'd be bad in Holland. <laughs> Two and one. Rip past Hernandez. <laughs> Strawberry up with it, and Reynolds is going to have his second extra base hit of the night. A double hit to lead off the sixth inning. Well, Dwight had struck him out on a curveball back in the third inning. After the leadoff home run that Reynolds hit in the first, he just took this pitch right down the line. Hernandez looked to have gotten a glove on that ball. It might have just ticked his glove. So the Pirates now have five hits and four extra base hits. Joe Orsalak, the batter, he tripled his last time up. He is a threat to bunt. He can fly. One and oh. Orsalak coming off a strong spring where he hit 390. He along with Johnny Ray who also hit 390 leading the Pirates in hitting this spring. Grounded towards second, Wally Backman to Hernandez, one away. On the play, Reynolds moves to third, and with one out, the batter will be Johnny Ray. It looked as if Dwight Gooden said something about his fastball to Keith Hernandez. Hernandez been known to come in and talk to Gooden and Dwight has appreciated the encouragement that Keith has given him and it appeared as if Dwight was telling Keith something about a problem with his fastball it's rare for him to say that he appears to be throwing very well 1 and 0 Johnny Ray last year seven home runs and in his career if you're thinking home run now he has hit 25 home runs and only one as a right-handed hitter. So a strong side from the left side. One and one. In last year's opener against the Cardinals at Shea, Gooden had a no decision. Starting against Joaquin Andujar. Ralph mentioned earlier the Cardinals won that or the Mets won that game six to five in ten innings. Good and work six innings in that game. Almost got away from Carter. That's where your pass balls come, Steve. It's not the balls really around the ankles. It's that ball that takes off right here. Gary just did get up there and almost, in fact, went too high, which you have a tendency to do when you see that ball start to sail. Curveball grounded to short. Reynolds scores, but Ray's out for an RBI, and it's now a three to two ball game. And you simply have to play your infield back in that situation. That's the big difference between a one run and a two run lead. That extra run makes all the difference in the world. Had the infield been in, that might have been a base hit into center field. The run would have scored anyway. And the batter, Sid Green, he's one for two with a double his last time up. You know, the characteristics of Bream, as we look, check the doctor, who has struck out only two tonight. He's walked to no one. I'm saying the characteristics of Bream, they traded Jason Thompson, Thompson to Montreal to make way for Bream. And Bream reminds me a lot of Jason Thompson. With this swing, he's got that sweeping swing. Just like that. 
That sweeping swing with not a lot of power the other way as Foster makes the catch. But the Pirates do score one on one hit. And after six, it's three to two, New York. Ralph Kiner joins Steve after this word from Manufacturers Hanover Trust. It's back-to-back -back sports competition Thursday night at 7.30 when the Mets take on the Pittsburgh Pirates right here on Channel 9, immediately followed by New York Rangers playoff hockey action. Be with us Thursday night here on Channel 9. Pat Clements, the new pitcher for the Pirates, and back in to call the action for you, Ralph Kiner. Clements taking over for Rick Rush, who will work the first six innings, giving up a total of three runs on five hits. Striking out five while walking five. And it's Len Dykstra to lead off in the first pitch ball one. Dykstra 0 for 2 on the game. He walked and scored in the first. Driven in by Keith Hernandez. Keith with a two base hit the left center field. Two balls no strikes. In the bullpen for the Mets. Ed Lentz the right hander nearest you and Rennie. Bruce Barani, the right-hander, near the wall. And Clements misses low in the count, 3-0. Pat Clements was 5-0 with the California Angels last year and then came to Pittsburgh where he was 0-2 in 27 games. Had two saves last year. And it's ball four on four pitches. So the Mets have Dykstra at first with no one out, leading by a score of three to two in the top of the seventh inning. And the batter will be Wally Backman batting from the right hand side. Wally hit 324 left handed last year and only 124, 100 points lower right handed. He, he is in a bunting situation right now. Russell incidentally went six, gave up three earned runs on five hits. He struck out five and walked five. looking for the sacrifice. Back when squares bunts it perfectly out to the first base side. Bream has it. And the throw to the second baseman Ray covering it first for the out. Dykstra moving down to second. So the Mets with a runner at second on the sacrifice. And Keith Hernandez coming up. You know that play Ralph points out what is often the difference between a contending ball club and an also ran. The ability to do the routine things on a daily basis. And I think lately in baseball, maybe the last decade, I don't know, maybe less, some of those things I think have been overlooked a lot and discounted somewhat. And also the other side of that coin, a pitcher walking the leadoff batter leads to trouble. And that's not doing the routine thing and the regular thing, which is the importance of getting the first out in the inning. So Keith Hernandez, who has the game-winning RBI at this point in this ball game, set a record last year when he had 24. Now in a position to drive in another run. Keith drove in the first run of the game with a double. And Clements misses with a breaking ball. Five in a row out of the strike zone. Keith has doubled, walked, and flied out to center field. Dykstra, the runner at second, one away. Mets leading three to two. And a good fastball. First strike. And that draws some applause. Clements from McLeod, California. He was the Angels' fourth round selection of the June 1983 draft, so he has arrived in the major leagues in a hurry. Attended UCLA. Dykstra causing some concern so Clements steps off the pitching rubber. Clements was acquired from the Angels with Mike Brown in the Candelaria deal. Rounded foul. One and two the count. Well it's opening day at Shea next Monday. We'd like to remind everyone planning to attend the opening day game at Shea on April 14th that the ballpark is sold out. And the Mets urge you to arrive early and, if at all possible, use public transportation. They will be arriving early and often, I have a feeling. One and two. And it's back to the middle of base hit. Moving around to third is Dykstra. The throw coming in 
to home is not in time and Dykstra scores and Hernandez with his second RBI and the Mets lead by a score of four to two. Well Keith picking up right where he left off at the end of last season. And what a key man he is and what a fine piece of hitting by Hernandez who controls that bat as well as anybody. The throw by Reynolds is way offline. It would have taken a real good throw to have a play at Dykstra. As you see, he's on the plate by the time the ball gets to Pena, even though Pena's up the line. And so now time is called as Leland goes to the mound. And that's all for his pitcher, Clements. So while we wait for the new relief pitcher, Mets leading by a score four to two. We'll take this opportunity as you look at the action in the bullpen and Cecilio Guante getting ready to come in to pitch. That's leading four to two on four runs on eight hits. They made no errors. The Pirates have two runs on five hits and they've made no errors. So we'll be back in just a moment right after this message. Right after Mets baseball on a post game edition of News 9 primetime results of our opinion nine question. Who will win more games this year, the Mets or the Yankees? If you say the Mets, call 1-900-210-1900. If you think the Yanks, call 1-900-210-1909. There's a 50 cent charge for each call. Stay tuned for News 9 primetime right after the Mets game. Cecilio Guente in to take over for Pat Clements. And he'll be working to the right-hand batter, Gary Carter. Guante was four and six last year with the Pirates. Had a 2.72 ERA and 63 appearances. He picked up five saves. Pitched 109 innings. And allowed 33 earned runs. Walked 40 while striking out 92. Guante in his fourth major league season. And he was signed as a non-drafted free agent by Pittsburgh back in 1979 out of the Dominican Republic. You know, Ralph, a lot of people are going to be watching how Jim Leland manages this ball club. And I equate it, I think, somewhat to longtime broadcaster and the late great Bob Prince, who was here for so many years. Whoever followed Prince as far as an announcer was a tough act to follow. And I think in some respects, Whoever follows Chuck Tanner anywhere has a bit of a problem because Tanner has such a great reputation. Of course, the club did not have great success last year, so there's not that kind of pressure on Leland in his first major league managerial job. But the manner in which he manages, I think, is going to be open to a great deal of scrutiny, especially since it's his first job. He doesn't have the patience that Tanner has. Very punctual type man. And now taking over after the Pirates had lost 104 ball games under Chuck Tanner. He calls himself a gut manager, and I guess that means that he is more reactive and tends to go with hunches more than playing it by the book. He might have a lot of stomach aches <laughs> after his first year here. <laughs> might need a little regular medication, a la Davy Johnson. And now Gary Carter, the batter. Gary is 0 for 2 with an RBI, and he hits it off the end of the bat foul. 32 years of age today. Drove in the Mets second run in the first inning with a sacrifice fly to left field struck out in the third routed back to the pitcher in the fifth. Russell on the losing side working six innings and now Guente the third pitcher used by Leland and Hernandez chased back. Keith had three stolen bases last year. Doesn't figure to be going anywhere. Mets first opening day win was back in 1970 and it was against Pittsburgh. Good slider. And it's strike two. Mets lost their first eight opening day games before winning in 70. The year after they were the world's champions. Two strikes to count.
struck him out. Fuente, a good strikeout artist. He averaged 7.6 strikeouts per nine innings last year. And with that sidearm delivery, when he drops down like that, he can really be tough on right-handers. Not only is that ball coming at you from a difficult angle, but he makes it do some funny things. So Guente picks up the second out of the inning. And it brings up Daryl Strawberry. Strawberry doubled and scored in the sixth. Scoring on Foster's double. Foster thrown out at third base trying to stretch it into a triple. Now Strawberry who has walked twice. One for one in this game. And the slider for a ball. Mets leading four to two. Two men away, top of the seventh inning. Ground ball foul. One ball, one strike, the count to Darrell, who batted 277 last year with 29 home runs. Strawberry's averaged 27 home runs and 83 RBIs a year in less than three years in the big leagues. And a lot of people think that's not enough man of his talent check swing off the fastball one and two well if I were a betting man I would bet that those averages will go up he led the National League in home run percentage home runs per time at bat last year having played in only 111 games and getting 29 home runs Throw to first base again. Hernandez makes it close. Keith's got to wonder what's going on. <laughs> Two men away. Now Strawberry takes some time. You might notice the patch on the left shoulder of the Mets uniform this year. That is commemorative of the 25th anniversary of the New York Mets. And of course, the Pittsburgh Pirates are celebrating their 100th season. One and two. And now two and two. The Pirates played in the first World Series ever played. That was back in. 1903 and they played against the Boston Red Sox who were in the American Association that was considered a major league at that time. Pirates lost it. And now uh, the count goes to three and two and they had Hannes Wagner in that team considered by a lot of people as the greatest player that ever played a great shortstop. Pirates also had the first radio broadcast ever that was back in 21 a fellow named Harold Arlen broadcast a Pittsburgh Philadelphia game. Pirates played the first night home opener in St. Louis. And they fielded the first all-black Major League team back in 1971. Three and two. Rounded foul. And you talk about that first broadcast, Ralph. That was actually on KDKA, the station that was actually the first commercial broadcasting facility in the country, and that's still the Pirate Station. I don't know that it was the entire Not the entire time. time. No, they lost it for a few years, got it back. Three and two. And it's fouled back out of play. Pittsburgh, the only team in baseball history, Major League Baseball history, to ever play a triple header. They did that in the last day of the season. Out of necessity, we might add. <laughs> Not by choice. They split the doubleheader and then play in the third game. It was called because of darkness. Before lights. Three and two. Ball four. Strawberry walks for the third time. Let's get their seventh walk in this game. And earlier, Ralph, you brought up an interesting point. Strawberry is going to get a lot of walks if he is patient as long as Foster is hitting behind him until George proves that he can hit the ball consistently with power. 
Jordan. Obviously, right now, Strawberry more of a threat and feared much more so than Foster. Especially with a right-hand pitcher on the mound. Right. George picked him up in the sixth inning with a bloop double to right, scoring Strawberry from second after a double. And the fastball for a ball. Foster struck out in the first. Grounded into a force play with the bases loaded in the third. Then picked up an RBI with a double in the sixth inning. Good slider, one and one. Guante has outstanding movement on his pitches, and his slider being probably his best pitch. Has a lot of late break. Was in 63 games last year, all in relief. Fastball foul back. Although you wouldn't call this a night game because it did start at six, officially a day game. Pirates played a night home opener for the first time last year. They drew 47,335. Not as many in here tonight. Slider strike three. So the Mets leave two as they pick up one run on one hit. And the score at the end of six and a half innings. The Mets four and the Pirates two. Now here's a word from the good old guys. As you Mets fans know, the 1986 season marks the silver anniversary of the Mets franchise. And to commemorate this landmark anniversary, the Mets have put together a sleek 25th anniversary book entitled The New York Mets, The First Quarter Century. Now, don't be fooled by other publications. This is the official 25th anniversary book of the Mets. And it says so right on the silver cover. The book is hardbound, a volume of Mets history told in candid, action-packed photographs and engaging essay, compiled and written by noted baseball historian Donald Honig. To get your copy of the Mets' official 25th anniversary book, send check or money order for $17.95 plus $3.25 for shipping and handling, a total of $21.20 to New York Mets 25th anniversary book, Department L, 160 Varick Street, New York, New York, 10013. And if you're like most Mets fans, you'll never seem to get enough enough news about your team. But now you can by picking up the latest copy of New York Mets Inside Pits, the official newspaper of the New York Mets. You can get Mets Inside Pitch at your local newsstand or by subscribing through this toll-free number during business hours. The number, 1-800-421-7751. You'll get 12 issues a year, inside information on the ball club, complete minor league reports including stats, the Mets trivia page, viewpoints of New York writers Red Foley, Dan Castellano, and Jack Lang, guest celebrity columnists, clubhouse clippings, and much more. It's the ultimate publication for ultimate Mets fans, and it's only $14.95. Once again, the number, 1-800-421-7751. Now we go to the bottom of the seventh. Steve Kemp to lead off. Kemp in this game takes the first pitch for ball one. Struck out, called out on strikes, and he has fly to left. And Gooden comes back and gets a strike. Gooden has struck out two in the game. He had the triple crown of pitching last year when he led the league in strikeouts, led the league in wins, and led the league in ERA. Last to do it, Steve Carlton. Two and one. And a good oh. curveball. That went right off the table. Boy, you talk about freezing a hitter. The doctor can do it. You have to be looking for that fastball, and then when he breaks one off like that, most hitters can't do anything about it. Back again, and it is strike three. Kemp knew it. Gooden gets his third strikeout. And the crowd boos. Well, I need one more K up there in the mini K corner. He got Kemp on a breaking ball similar to this back in the first inning. Now, they had to have brought more Ks than that if they're doing it for the duck. Even with the action going out here on the first ball game of the year. Now it's Tony Pena. He looks at the fastball. Pena 
0 for 2 tonight lined into a big double play for the Mets in the fourth. Hernandez taking the line drive and turning it into a double play as Sid Bream let off the inning with a double and was trapped off second. Good fastball. Not only a good fastball but an outstanding location. Pena thought it was going to be inside and it was right over the inside corner. And the fastball foul back out of play. Does he take a cut or what? Look at his back. <laughs> he takes a cut in both directions. Pena, after last year's opening night win against the St. Louis Cardinals, said, I hope it lasts. <laughs> it didn't. <laughs> and you know, you and Tim were mentioning earlier about how he hurt a rib muscle in spring training swinging to bat and we have talked about it last year about it. it's amazing that he hasn't injured himself the way he swings and sure enough this spring he did he's dangerous for a catcher with that backlash you got to be sure you don't get hit fastball grounded to the shortstop Santana two men away Mets leading four to two there's another big rip, an inside high heater that really got in his kitchen, and he hit it off below the trademark of the bat, actually. But that didn't slow down his swing or his recoil. Any. So now two men away, and Jim Morrison, the batter. Jim has grounded out and flied out. Morrison hitting 254 last year in 92 ball games. That curveball hanging high, one ball, no strike. Morrison certainly played well against New York last year. He hit 333 against the Mets. And the fastball foul back. Some of those were key hits, particularly in that first game of that final three game series here last September. Pirates and Mets played 18 games last year with the Mets winning 10 and the Pirates winning eight of their 104 losses. Head on to the Mets. This one in foul territory. And out of reach. Howard Johnson did the right thing there. He went over and found out where that railing was and then sort of worked his way along the railing in an effort to get to the ball. It does two things. Keeps you from getting hurt and also puts you in a position to be able to make a play on the ball rather than having to react to the fence or the wall or the railing. Got a chance to get over there and reach into the stands and make that play if you get over there in a hurry. One and two the count. Curveball. And I don't know how he laid off of that one. Two balls, two strikes. Doctor broke one off again, just a little bit low, I guess. <laughs> I guess I guess you guess. <laughs> there it is again. This time it's no guess. And Gooden strikes out two in the inning, his third and fourth. And the Pirates go in order. The score at the end of seven. The Mets four, the Pirates two. Now here's a word from Michelob Light. Howard Johnson, the leadoff for the Mets in the eighth, then it's strike one. Cecilio Guente in relief, working to Howard, who has been up three times with a double. Johnson doubled right over the first base bag his last time up. And this ball fouled away. Johnson did not have a good year last year at the plate, as everyone knows. Not certainly what was expected of him, but he did hit very well against the Pirates. He hit 347 against Pittsburgh pitching. First broadcast on Channel 9 in the regular season. First of 90, and there is a ball. One and two the count. And there is Mr. Ojeda, Bob Ojeda, throwing in the bullpen. 
recently acquired from the Boston Red Sox. That's how he looks from our high camera. <laughs> That's our blimp shot. The camera high down the left field line. Oh, he'd ask him for number 19, getting it from Ron Gardenhire. This ball popped up in the shallow left, coming over as Kemp. And Johnson is out. So Guante retires his third batter in this game. He has pitched to four, walking one. And he will now pitch to Rafael Santana, both from the Dominican Republic. Santana with a home run off Guante, his second home run in his major league career, and it came last year. Slider. One ball, no strikes. Mets leading four to two. Fastball fouled away. One ball, one strike. Raphael 0 for 3 in the game. Got a chance to pick up an RBI with a green light on a 3-0 pitch, but grounded out. Two balls, one strike. Mets scored two in the first. Pirates got one back. Mets then got into a position of leading three to one. Pirates got another back and then added one more to make it four to two. Fly ball to shallow right center. Joe Orslack is there and two men away. That will bring up Dwight Gooden. Well, I think if Dwight is going to make good on his wager with Marty Noble of Newsday, he has to do it now. Fourth and bad, he bet that he'd hit a home run in this contest, and if he did, Noble would have had to shave off his beard, all his facial hair, right? As I understand it, the whole beard, and Marty has a full beard, has to come off. Dwight already has a single. Is Marty with the white shirt on. He has trimmed that down a little bit. Last year, Danny <laughs> Castellano made a bet about shaving off his beard. The three man. beards. <laughs> and he happened to win his. Didn't have to shave it. Two and one to count to White Good. What did he bet? David Johnson of the Mets to win six in a row? Something or like a winning streak. Good and a good pitch to hit out of here, but he fouls it back. Well, our annual tri trivial question, trivia question. There's strike three. We'll get to that in a while. As the Mets go in order, and the score at the end of seven and a half innings, it's the Mets four and the Pirates two. Now, here's a word from 9X Yellow Pages. A familiar face of Lee Mazzilli as he comes up to pinch hit for Sam Khalifa. As we go to the bottom of the eighth inning and coming in for the play-by-play, -play, Steve Sabrisky. Thanks, Ralph. Lee Mazzilli, of course, very popular when he was in New York. And really unhappy here in Pittsburgh. Has sought a trade for a few years and been unable to be accommodated in that department and had some hopes with the new management and ownership that that might happen, but here he is on opening day, still with the Pirates. Did a good job as a pinch hitter. Had an on-base percentage last year of 437. 15 walks. And he hit 282 coming off the bench, and that's not too shabby. And we'll get to that trivia question. 4-2, to two, New York leads at bottom half of the eighth inning. And a fastball high and away. Only once in the history of baseball has a team come into a game with the averages staying the same after the game was over. Every player in that game had the same average after the game was over as they did when they came into the game. And that was the, on one side, the team that played against the Cleveland Indians. Do you know the answer to that? I do. As I told you. <laughs> now, I guessed half of it. 
I guessed half of it. But that giving the Cleveland Indians was a good clue. A little help there. A little help there. I'll even give you the year. It was 1940. Two and one the count to Brazil. As Gooden wants a different baseball. And the team was the White Sox. They started the game with the same average that they had after it was over. The whole team, everybody that batted. Right there with a the fastball, two and two. Mazzilli disagrees with home plate umpire Bob Engel. Bob Feller pitched a no hitter on opening day for Cleveland. Everybody started with a 0 0 average, and everybody finished with a 0 0 0 average. Only time a no hitter's been pitched on opening day. Easy ground ball to Hernandez, who outraces Maz to the bag. And there's one out. Well, Keith, with that great pair of hands, gets the glove down and decides to take it by himself. And so they, of course, still runs very, very well. And there was a good shot, too, Ralph, of Hernandez going over and getting in front of the ball with his body on a ball in which he had the opportunity to do that. And that's really a mark of a good fielder, not, not to get away from those fundamentals. Made only four errors last year, fielded 997, the best in the National League, and won another gold glove as eight. Bill Allman will pinch hit for Cecilio Guante now with one out here in the eighth inning. Allman a one-time Met. And last year he was a starter. He hit 286 this spring as Jim Wynn warms up in the Pirate bullpen and will more than likely be the next Pittsburgh pitcher. Breaking ball from Gooden for strike one. Allman played for the Mets briefly and ineffectively in 1980. Hit 270 here in Pittsburgh last year with six homers and 29 RBIs. He is what you call a versatile player. He has played every position but pitcher in his major league career. Now in his 10th year. Low and inside, one and one. He attended Brown University and was the Padres' number one draft pick. And a fastball right down Broadway, and it's one ball, two strikes. Behind the fastball is Bill Allman, and it's still one and two. Gooden appears to be heating up a little bit, and I'm not trying to make excuses for the fact that he's had some shots hit off of him, and of course everybody expects superhuman effort from him. But he does not like the cold weather, and it is a little cool here tonight. Again, Allman behind the fastball, it's still one and two. And it looks to be Ralph, like now Dwight has really found it. He's throwing the ball better right now than he had earlier in the game. And you can tell it's cold. <laughs> Even the hot dog is cold. <laughs> that was some jacket. And that high heater, and Gooden has now struck out five. Of the five strikeouts, Dwight has picked up three of them in the last two innings. And now they're getting out the K's a little more rapidly. Fernando Valenzuela struck out nine in his complete game victory over San Diego his first time out, so he leads the National League in strikeouts. Albeit temporarily. R.J. Reynolds has had a big night. Two for three with a home run and a double, and he takes a fastball for strike one. And last year, Reynolds, with both Los Angeles and Pittsburgh, hit 340 against the Mets, so he's picked up where he left off with the two for three so far tonight. Breaking ball grounded in the hole. Backman with a diving stop and throws him out. Nice play, Wally Backman, to end the inning. A 1 2 3 inning for Dwight Gooden in the eighth. And going to the ninth, the Mets still lead Pittsburgh 4 to 2 after this for Manufacturers Hanover Trust. Wally Backman will be hitting second here in the ninth, but to end the eighth inning, he made a fine play. Hernandez breaking for the bag at first as he sees he can't get to it. Backman with a diving stab. And coming up throwing, Backman led all second baseman in fielding last year. So he's done quite a job. 
Bill Allman stays in the game and plays shortstop for Sam Khalifa, who Mazzilli hit for, and Jim Wynn is, in fact, the new pitcher for Pittsburgh. Wynn, with a record of 3-6 and six last year, was in 30 games, 7 as a starter, and he had an earned run average of 5.23. He was selected by Pittsburgh in the 1981 free agent draft in the first round. So they consider him quite a pro pro prospect. And he has an uncanny physical resemblance, at least in my mind, to another Pittsburgh right-handed reliever, Don Robinson. They looked enough alike to be brothers. Well, Lynn Dykstra, the leadoff batter, will lead it off here in the ninth inning, a 4-2 New York lead. Dykstra is 0 for 2, but he has walked twice and scored two runs. And he takes ball one. Lenny is flying deep to left and deep to center in his other two at bats. Backman and Hernandez to follow. And he lofts one into center field again and fairly deep. And Orsalak, the right fielder, well over into center field, playing him that way, makes the catch. Second baseman, Wally Backman. The estimated attendance here tonight, 50,000, which would be more than they had last year when they had 47,000 plus. But not a record. Not a record. Wally Backman now with one out and nobody on. Wally is 0 for 2. He has also walked and sacrificed in his other two at bats. Wally hit 328 against Pittsburgh last year. And he takes high ball one. Of course, hit 273 overall. Right back to Wynn, who flags it down. And there are two away. Keith Hernandez is two for three with two RBIs and a run score. Hernandez doubled the drive in a run in the first and then later scored on a sacrifice fly by Gary Carter. He drove in another run with a single to center in the seventh inning. the media has treated this ball club Ralph it's almost as if they could phone it in it's never that easy no <laughs> but if the Mets can hold on and win this ball game they'll at least be tied for first place <laughs> all those W's count Mets won 98 last year and finished second they have won more games than any team in the major leagues over the last two years and they have not been a winner won 98 and 90 in their last two years. Fly ball to left. Kemp. And an easy inning for Jim Wynn here in the ninth. The Mets go in order with a two-run lead leading Pittsburgh 4-2. to two. We'll go to the bottom half of the ninth after this for Lincoln Mercury. Joe Orsalak leads off the ninth inning against Dwight Gooden with the Mets leading Pittsburgh 4-2. to two. And the curveball stays high for ball one. Orsalak to be followed by Johnny Ray and Sid Breen. Orsalak with a triple in three at bats. And the fastball a little high, and it's 2-0. and oh. Fastball right in there, 2-1 and one now. Gooden has shown the same pattern in this ball game that he has shown his first two years, and that is an ability to get stronger as the game goes along. Popped up, but it'll be out of play behind the New York dugout on the count now two and two. Gooden has never pitched more than nine innings in his brief major league career of two years. Of course, pitching in the ninth inning right now. Three and two. And what is left of this somewhere in the vicinity of what was a 50,000 person crowd 
really making some noise here in the ninth. And again, it's fouled back out of play. So the count holds at three and two. And a fastball, and Orsalak just did get a piece of it to stay alive. The count remaining at three and two. Roger McDowell to the left and Jesse Orozco the left hander on the right hand side of your screen. High fastball popped up. Johnson may have a play but no it's back about 10 or 12 rows. Still three and two. And I wonder how many pitches Dwight has thrown. That is obviously a concern and has always been of Davey Johnson and the Mets front office and could be tonight this early in the season. But it is the ninth inning. Ball four. And that's good. His first walk of the game. It also will bring the tying run to the plate. Orsalak, remember, runs extremely well. And Johnny Ray handles the bat very well. Of course, Orsalak is of no concern as the tying run is at the plate. If Orsalak scores, it doesn't mean anything. Johnny Ray, one for three, a single to right back in the first inning. He also drove in a run with a ground out in the sixth. hit base hit right field Orslak will stop at second as strawberry is up with it quickly hit number six for Pittsburgh and they have the tying runs aboard with nobody out here in the ninth inning so the first matter concern for Davy Johnson is good and tiring do you go to the bullpen the decision will have to be made by Davy Johnson. The matter coming up, Sid Bream, and we'll see how Pittsburgh plays it. Will they sacrifice to get the time run down the second base? Decision time. The entire infield having a conference, including catcher Gary Carter. Bream is one for three with a double in three trips. And it's a good one. Gooden will have to tag him to make the sacrifice out as the runners advance to third and second. The Mets were not looking for the sacrifice, and there is a little bit of insight on how Leland manages. He had his cleanup batter, his fourth hitter up here with no one out, and he sacrifices with his fourth batter. Gooden makes the play, picks up the out. And now the time run is at second base. And the batter will be Steve Kemp. Kemp is 0 for 3 as each manager takes a certain posture. Kemp has been struck out twice by Gooden and both times they were called third strikes on curveball. And the fastball is high. In Kemp's other at bat, he lofted a lazy fly ball to left field. And a curveball for a swinging strike one. It's one and one. Good curveball by Gooden on that pitch. He really broke it off. Right here, the curve in a great spot. Kemp right over the top of it. And Gooden gets it counted one and one. Runners at second and third with one out. Another breaking ball. It misses high and away. Two and one. 
Orsalak at third, and Johnny Ray the tying run at second. Four to two, New York leads it with one out in the ninth. High cheese for strike two, two and two. Right here, the fastball in a very good spot. Up around the letters, and good now. Looking for a strikeout. He's had five in this game. He needs one here. And he gets it. Another fastball. It had to be somewhere in the vicinity of 93 or 94 miles an hour. Blew it right by him. Good and struck out two in the seventh. One in the eighth. And now he has a big one here in the ninth. And he's one out away from picking up his first win of this year. The batter, Tony Pena. Pena, 0 for 3, has grounded out twice and lined out to Hernandez in a double play. Two out with runners at second and third. A tapper, and Gooden will take it himself, and the Mets win the first game of the 1986 season. Dwight Gooden picks up his first victory and first complete game as New York wins it four to two. Ralph and I'll be right back to wrap it up here at Three River Stadium in Pittsburgh. Stay with us. Once again, the final score, New York four and Pittsburgh two. We're back after this word from Michelob Light. Well, Dwight Gooden came through as he has in the past. When the going gets tough, he really gets tough. And Dwight Gooden with the time run on base, a chance to see the ball game tied up, got the final out, and this is it on the replay. Well, the doctor getting a, a free swinging Tony Pena to tap right back to him, and uh, here's the reaction of Davey Johnson in the dugout. And as you saw earlier in the shots Bill Webb gave us of both managers, that's a little release right there, too, because, you know, Ralph, there has been pressure put on this ball club to win this year. You mentioned earlier the Mets have won more games than any other team the last two years. The pressure is not really felt by the players, but it has been put on the players. And what the players feel, I think, more than anything else, is determination. Because they want to turn those vast number of wins that they've had the last two years into a championship this year. They don't feel the pressure. They feel determined to do it. And they're off to a good start, obviously, by this ball game tonight. Well, every win counts the same, whether it's the first game of the year or the last game of the year. In fact, maybe the first game of the year, it's more important. The Mets get off to a great start behind Dwight Gooden, who came through in the jam, got out of that ninth inning and picked up the win. David Johnson had to make the decision whether to leave him in or take him out for the bullpen. He left him in. Right now, let's go down to Tim McCarver and his special guest. Uh, Ralph, you mentioned the first game of the year. Keith Hernandez, the star of the game, one of the stars of the game with two RBIs. Why in the world is the first game of the year, why does it seem like, even for the players, such an important game? Well, I think it's just anticipation of the year. You know, we had a long, a little longer spring training. At least it felt like it. And you anticipate the game. You know, and it, it last six years now it hasn't been where I've been nervous at the plate the first at bat like earlier in my career. But I think the adrenaline pumping and uh, the anticipation. I know when I hit the double the first time up and I went away to third in the throw, and my legs were just gone. <laughs> and you know, I had to make sure I kept real, real cool and quiet on the bench and uh, not to get over overly high. And um, thank goodness that uh, I had the RBI situation uh, in that fourth time up. That made me bear down. Uh, bear down against the left-hander you did. Of course, as we're seeing right now, that's a double the other way. And it's always good also to, to keep that front side in there and to be, have a pitcher out there where you can afford to go the other way rather than speeding up your bat. Uh, uh, I know a lot of the, the problems that a lot of hitters have early in the season because it's cold. You're coming out of Florida, and you have a tendency to be out in front of everything. Well, you know, it's just a mess. Sometimes you get off great, and you're right there and sink, and it's always nice to get that first one out of the way, the first at bat. And Ruschel is uh, a sinker ball pitcher, and I kind of was setting up out there, and he threw me a sinker away, and he got it up a little bit. I'm glad to get it. Gary Carter told me in the dugout that Dwight Gooden was throwing better in the ninth than he was in the first inning. Well, you know, I can tell from the side. Wally and I were talking during the game. We knew that Doc really didn't have that good pop. And around the eighth inning, you can just see him when he can smell it. He shuts the door. You play with Bob Gibson, you know. There's yep. that type of pitcher. Yep. Keith Hernandez with two RBIs, a single and double. Matter of fact, he drove in the first run of the year for the Mets tonight. Congratulations, Keith. Thank you, Tim. 
Let's go back to the booth to Ralph and Steve. Well, to Dwight Gooden got four of his six strikeouts in the ball game from the seventh inning on. He got a big strikeout, but he got Steve Kemp with the time run to second base and then got the final out against Tony Pena on his first pitch to Pena to win it by a score of four to two. So the Mets get their victory here in the opening night game. And the final score once again, the Mets four and the Pirates two. Mets baseball has been brought to you by Michelob Light. Super premium taste and less filling beer. Who says you can't have it all? By Manufacturers Handover Trust. We realize your potential. By Nissan, who invites you to test drive the all new 1987 Nissan Sentra at your Nissan dealer now. By Burger King. Their new chicken tenders are real chicken fillets, not processed nuggets. By RC Cola. People go out of their way for the taste of RC. By the good old guys, your New York, New Jersey, and Southern Connecticut Oldsmobile dealers. By Pure Later Courier, the name to remember in Overnight Express. Be with us again on Thursday when the New York Mets take on the Pittsburgh Pirates at 7.35 p.m. right here on WRTV. Mets Baseball 86, executive producer Rick Miner. Produced and directed by Bill Webb, associate director Dick Wargo. Promotional consideration was provided by True Value Hardware Stores and Home Centers. Watch your favorite team anywhere you go with this Casio LCD pocket television with clear black and white reception. Compliments of True Value Hardware Stores and Home Centers. And by Wayne Scott. Our guests will receive a gift from Wayne Scott. You never get a second shot at a first impression. Impress the first time with Wayne Scott shirts, knits, sweaters, and underwear for young men. Available at stores everywhere. Wayne Scott. Mets Baseball 86 is a production of Channel 9 Sports. Production facilities arranged through Vanda Communications. Announcers on the preceding telecast were approved and contracted for by Doubleday Sports Incorporated. Now this is Ralph Kiner for Tim McCarver and Steve Sabriska. Sabrisky saying good night from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Bring it home, Dr. King. Proud enough, strong enough, tough enough. Loud enough, we're putting our hands together, making our best.